welcome all to isa online pg classes today we have amongst us a very senior anesthesiologist teacher of teachers professor r gopinath sir right now sir is professor and hod at esi medical college and hospital sir has done md from pgi ba from uk and then subsequently ffa or csi sir has more than 160 publications and seven chapters in different books special interests are in cardiac anesthesia pain relief and intensive care management sir has delivered prestigious numerous orations including brigadier pn but oration va punnus oration pn thota oration vijayalakshmi kamath orations and other orations sir has been past president of acta and chairperson of educational cell of acta sir is on editorial board and reviewer of ija dscp aca and bmc today sir shall be talking about cardiopulmonary Card, no no cardiac cardiac implantable, implantable external devices the anesthetic uh, implications and uh, during this course of lectures uh, everybody will be muted and if there are any questions or queries you can type them in the chat box and uh, that will be taken up subsequently at the end of the talk and if there are any questions from sir side you can answer them either at the end of the talk or you can type in the chat box also uh, this class is live streamed on youtube of isa isa nhq and will be available on website of isa isa web dot in uh, i'll mute everybody and i'll request sir uh, to unmute himself and uh, uh, share the slides the slides are visible sir you have to unmute yourself from the first slide is that okay now yeah uh, yeah full screen over audio and slides are good sir over to you sir thank you very much thank you thank you for those kind words of introduction professor navin and uh, <clears throat> these are all uh, sort of topics which uh, basically you do see sometimes in practice but it's important to know how you uh, manage a patient uh, who has such devices and uh, the cardiac implantable electronic devices uh, were uh, earlier termed as pacemakers or pulse generators and uh, now they are uh, labeled as cieds and uh, some implications for us as anesthesiologists so uh, we will go through the uh, implications of the same uh, in the coming slides so i will intersperse them with some cartoons uh, so that you are happy and uh, all of us are aware of uh, dennis the menace and uh, so if your heart skips a beat especially when you are seeing some uh, you know younger heroines on the screen uh, you should be looking for a pacemaker so why are we interested in uh, these cieds or electronic implantable devices is that uh, essentially a lot of people with ischemic heart disease and cardiac disease uh, are seen uh, in across the world and uh, this is uh, basically we don't have any not much data from indian uh, scenario but there are registries coming up this is from the united states and uh, there are nearly 40000 devices which are implanted annually there and uh, if you see more than 3/4 are for dysrhythmias with slow rhythms or bradi dysrhythmias they are essentially atrioventricular conduction blocks and sick sinus syndrome and such uh, bradi dysrhythmias and about 5000 of them are for life threatening tachydysrhythmias and they are essentially with what we call aicds or automated or artificial implantable cardioverter defibrillators 
and these are the ones which terminate life threatening tachycardias even without the knowledge of the patient the rest of them are of course for treatment of heart failure and these are also growing in numbers and they are called the cardiac resynchronization therapy devices or the crtds so there are if you see there are a host of devices and uh, the recent ones or the later ones are the ones which uh, you know read out the rhythm of the patient and automatically initiate a sequence of defibrillating uh, the patient's uh, this rhythm and also to synchronize the chambers the right and the left chambers in patients who have heart failure with the resynchronization therapy devices so one should be aware of the basic knowledge of the pathophysiology of whichever cardiac disorder and comorbidities for which the patient has received this kind of device the second thing you should be knowing about is what is this device per se what are the characteristics of these devices and once we know that we should also know like you know you have a workstation you have gas disconnection and things like that so likewise you should know factors which interfere with the working and management of such devices for us to have safe outcomes in our patients it is essential that we know all about the three factors that we talked about earlier that is pathophysiology of the cardiac disorder it could be heart failure it could be dysrhythmias it could be ischemic cardiomyopathy and what type of device is it that the patient is having and what can affect the working of this device so the implantable electronic devices basically consist of what is called a pg or a pulse generator this is the one which gives you the electrical impulses and this is conducted through one or more pacing leads which are attached to the heart so there is a device there are wires and it goes to the heart so if there is only one electrode it is called a unipolar lead the single electrode at the pacing tip acts as the current emitting cathode so the box itself the pacemaker generator or pulse generator itself serves as the anode to complete the electrical circuit so a unipolar device has only one electrode in the heart whereas a bipolar device or when there are two of these pacing leads the anode lies on the lead itself just proximal to the cathode tip so that the circuit is very short it is like our unipolar or bipolar the uh, cautery whereas the anode lies right next to the cathode and this reduces the susceptibility to electromagnetic interference which is why bipolar leads are more and more used in permanent devices whereas unipolar is used in temporary settings like you know when somebody comes to comes to the uh, has a heart uh, an mi and requires immediate pacing so you put a transvenous single pacing or you have something like you know epicardial leads are placed in children which are for temporary use post cardiac surgery so you have both bipolar and you have unipolar leads with a pulse generator so the device uh, coming to other characteristics it can be placed in a single chamber that is the lead is just in the right atrium why in the right atrium because that is where the conduction system arises so you would like to terminate or regulate all dysrhythmias starting from the right atrial wall or it could be dual chamber that is you are having the lead in both the right atrium and the right ventricle so that you can have some control over the conduction and synchronicity between the right atrium and the right ventricle which is what normally happens in the heart through the normal conduction system whereas in biventricular there are that is which the resynchronization therapy or resynchronization therapy with defibrillator function there are three leads there is one in the right atrium there is one in the right ventricle and then there is one in the coronary sinus for the left ventricle we can't pierce the interventricular septum or go into the aorta and enter the left ventricle directly 
So through the right atrium itself, you enter through the coronary sinus and leave it as far inside as possible so that the, through the coronary sinus, you can stimulate the left ventricle. And this is used for resynchronization therapy, especially in patients who have heart failure. So in implantable cardioverter defibrillator devices, you have a pulse generator, you have pacing and sensing electrodes and defibrillation or shock electrode. So you have three electrodes in this, so three leads in this, one of them being the shock electrode. So we will see in later slides how you can differentiate this in when you have to find out what device the patient is having. So just like everything else, we have classifications. So we have classification by the North American Society of Physiological and Electrophysiology and the British uh, group, and uh, they have a generic pacemaker code. So this is given us, earlier we had only three positions. Now with multifunctional or multiple role or multiple use or better technology, there are multiple roles for the same device and they can be identified based on what position the, you attribute it to. The position one is for the paste chamber or whichever chamber is placed. So you have this nomenclature, O is none, A is atrium, V is ventricle, or D is for dual, that is atrium and ventricle. The same at position two, and this is for the chamber sensed. Whereas in position three, you have, how does the heart respond to the sensing? There is zero is none, I is inhibited, that is when there is a intrinsic rhythm or an intrinsic electrical impulse, the pulse generator is inhibited. That is, it does not provide a stimulus to start the heart or have a use the role of the pulse generator. T is triggered, a small electrical impulse, which might not be sufficient for generating a electrical impulse in the heart itself, will be used to trigger off the device. Whereas D is dual, it could be both triggered or inhibited. Position four is for programmability. Zero is none and R is for rate modulation. Rate modulation is whenever you have some physiological needs, say there is exercise or a patient has some anxiety or there is some activity. So the device itself modulates the rate based on various sensing devices to increase the rate of the pulse generator. Five is position five is multi-site pacing. So same as like the chamber sensed and the chamber paced. An automatic implantable cardioverter defibrillator, what does it do? It has some additional role like we talked about. That is, it is supposed to detect ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation which is the tachydis rhythms, which are life-threatening, and then react. So it has some, um, it, it is like uh, you know, artificial intelligence, let us say. So we have uh, like, you know, ST trending uh, on your ECG, so many things, you know, all of them are basically, uh, you know, rudimentary artificial intelligence kind of uh, algorithms. And this is what is called the PDF. So this is called the probability density function. What does it do? It analyzes the time the ECG is away from the baseline. So the response to rate or rate and PDF is taken as the final thing. So it analyzes the time the ECG is away from the baseline that is fed into it, just like the ST trending. And then it takes about 15 seconds for sensing the dysrhythm. Once it senses an abnormal tacky dysrhythm, it takes about 15 seconds to charge and then it delivers a shock. So depending on the type of the device, the battery and you know, where the patient's characteristics or how many times on Holter monitoring he has been seen to have episodes of VTVF, the device can give six shocks per event and some of them came up to 18 shocks per event. So that is how definitive these devices are that it can trigger off multiple shocks to discharge or revert back the rhythm, which is a life-threatening rhythm. The, the defibrillation per se requires a lot of energy. 
and this energy can exceed or go up to 750 volts which is at the site or immediately at the point of delivery and this usually is measured in joules and for us to defibrillate or internally defibrillate, external defibrillators, we go to 100, depending on the requirement or the type, monophasic, biphasic, we can go up to 200, 350 joules. Whereas when you have to give an internal shock, generally the output is about 30 to 45 joules. So that is how much energy the defibrillator or the AICD device delivers to the heart to revert the rhythm back to normal. So it also has some anti-tachycardia pacing functions. Whereas a programmed burst of overdrive pacing is used to attempt to terminate the VT. So in, 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 in devices which have much more functions or multi-programmability, what it can do is it can do, it is like overdrive, we call overdrive pacing. When you have when you 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 have a rate which is about 150, 160. So you go up to 300, 400 to capture that to capture that rate and then slowly bring it back to normal. So this is the anti-tachycardia pacing capability. And the ICD has anti-bradycardia capabilities of a pacemaker as well. And this is able to pace in the event of post-shock brad bradycardia. So whenever you give a shock, suddenly you say when you're doing CPR, you give a shock, you notice that the heart rate doesn't come back to 80, 90, 100. It just goes down to 30, 40, and then slowly picks up, which might not be good enough for a patient who is walking around without knowing what is happening in his heart. So in this, the anti-bradycardia capabilities also come in or kick in. And in events of post-shock bradycardia, they bring it back to the normal rate or the programmed rate of the patient. So typically patients who have AICDs, if you do a Holter monitoring, <coughs> they would have had multiple episodes of BTVF, bradycardia, bradycardia, then they wouldn't even know. They are not even aware. <coughs> they don't even realize that they've had a VTVF. So similarly, there is a generic code for defibrillators. There are here four positions. One, the first position is the shock chamber. The second, like I mentioned, is the anti-tachycardia pacing chambers. The third position is for tachycardia detection, where it detects either from an electrogram or an ECG or electrical impulse or hemodynamic. It could be uh, basically acidosis, whatever it is. So there are multiple ways where it, by tachycardia detection can happen. Can happen. And position four is for a anti-bradycardia pacing chambers. Like the first two, the third, fourth one is also non-atrium ventricular dual. Whereas the tachycardia detection is based on these two, E and H, which is electrical or hemodynamic disturbances. So currently all of us uh, you know, are supposed to be using ICD codes and the ICD-10 CM code for the presence of a cardiac pacemaker is designated as Z79.0. So this is something you should remember if you have a patient and you are doing, you know, you have an ABH accreditation or JSA accreditation, you are supposed to enter this code for the presence of a cardiac pacemaker. So we talked about electromagnetic interference earlier. So which is that sometimes the bipolar or unipolar is more prone for electromagnetic interference rather than a bipolar, which has less uh, sort of chances of uh, being uh, being uh, disturbed by EMI. So EMI is basically electromagnetic or radio, radio frequency waves from 0 to 10 to the power of 9 hertz or micro waves which are of further higher frequencies that is 10 to the power of 9 to 10 to the power of 11 hertz. So these any of these can disturb or cause interference. Whereas higher frequency waves such as X-rays, the gamma rays, infrared, ultraviolet, right, they do not cause any interference with these electrical devices or implantable cardiac devices. So one has to remember that the ranges below 10 to the power of 11, 0 to 10 to the power of 11, RF or microwaves. RF is generally what we use for in terms of uh, cautery and things like that, lithotripsy and you know, uh, MRI and things. We'll come to that in the later slide. So 
This is what you should remember, radio frequency, anything less than 10 to the power of 11 hertz. So when it comes to interference with the function of these devices, there is a potential for disruption by either electrocautery or other electronic equipment. So one should be very cautious, which is what I said amongst the three important cardinal things that you know, should know is, what are the factors which can cause disruption of the CIED device? So we knew about, we talked about the basics, so briefly about what are the causes for which these patients can get these devices. So again, the potential for disruption or actual disruption, the magnitude depends on whether there is monopolar or bipolar cautery current in use. Monopolar has higher propensity because current impulse perceived as aberrant cardiac impulse with inhibition or triggering of device. And this can have very catastrophic consequences for the patient. So please remember, whenever a patient has a device in, in situ like a pacemaker or CID, always ensure or look out for what the surgical colleague is using and tell them very categorically that monopolar should not be used unless there is no other choice for which we will talk about later, how to manage with when you have a monopolar. So wherever possible, bipolar only or any other form. So like I said, bipolar leads are less vulnerable because they have a very small antenna loop. So the circuit, like I said, is in a unipolar lead is between the cathode and the anode. The anode can be, the cathode is where you have the, the cautery part and the anode is your cautery plate. So there is a huge amount of time and loop for which through which there is disruption. So bipolars, like I said, are very close to each other and hence will not have any large antenna loops. So some of the devices um, which have come up recently use titanium casing and some noise protection algorithms for, like you have, you know, your headsets, your headsets, your earbuds, which say noise cancellation uh, algorithms or noise. So here also you can incorporate the same noise protection algorithms or to prevent the current from affecting the pulse generator, you can use titanium casing or shielding on the devices to protect it from getting disrupted by aberrant electrical electromagnetic uh, energy. So what are the implications? Like I said earlier, it can either trigger or inhibit the, the uh, device. So we call them as under sensing. So under sensing is that it can cause the device to fail to detect any intrinsic atrial or ventricular activity and will not function as it should or will not trigger off or pace the patient. Consequently, overpacing can also occur while the pulse generator fires despite intrinsic activity with the potential for malignant disturbance. So if it is overpacing, what happens? The patient can have has a rhythm of his own, but there is a chance that the pulse generator can trigger off or itself fire causing malignant dystrythmia. So if there is a normal, say, ECG with a uh, R wave, this can cause an RMT phenomenon kind of uh, situation and trigger off malignant tachydystrythmia. Over sensing is inappropriate detection of myocardial activity when none of it exists. That is, the EMI itself is detected as inappropriate myocardial activity because of the electrical impulses. And this is the oversensing as related to the or as opposed to the undersensing that we talked about earlier. So this leads to failure to pace when there is no intrinsic electrical activity. So in the presence of this kind of EMI, if the heart itself is not generating, then there is a over sensing or it is not sensing. It thinks the heart is also beating because of the EMI where it actually the heart has stopped acting. So, and will not pace. So this is the most common interference with EMI. Over sensing is the most common interference with the electromagnetic interference. 
So in a hospital setting, we have multiple sources of interference. So we'll start by one, one by one. So if you look at the hospital sources, what do you have? You have radio frequency current, which is usually unipolar in configuration. And like I said, the cot cautery plate or the anode plate is present attached to the patient's skin, generally around the foot or anywhere like that. So that is something that you have to take cognizance of. And this is in the range of 300 to 500 kilohertz. We had talked about 10 to the power of 11 hertz, so 0 to 10 to the power of 11. So this also constitutes or at the lower level of the radio frequency interference. And uh, how does this happen? This is related to the distance and orientation of current to the patient's device and leads. So if you have the cautery very close to the the pulse generator or the leads itself that is on the thoracic cage or under the subclavicle or the, the cord and, and the leads are also oriented or if it is directly perpendicular to the, the, uh, the uh, pulse generator or, uh, orientation, then you have interference which can be magnified. So cautery and diathermy, we use uh, sort of uh, um, interchangeably. So diathermy is generally short wave and it's directly applied to the skin. So one should avoid it anywhere close to the generator site. So why is it so? Because the short wave diathermy is applied directly to the skin, there is a potential or tendency to heat up when the tissues are burnt or cauterized. So there, this could lead to overheating of the circuitry of the generator. They are all compact, small devices. So when we were training, they were bulky. They had uh, you know, different kinds of sources of battery and things like that. So their lifespan was very short. Now you have very compact and multifunction uh, pulse generators, which are so small, they can be tucked small, put away in a small pocket under the skin. And the heat can also damage very sensitive electronic components. So we have to now understand if you have a patient with a, cot, a pacemaker or a pulse generator or an AICD or whatever category, then how do we evaluate this patient or assess this patient in the preoperative period? One is to identify the pacemaker itself. What is it? Then you have to, we have talked about the various pacing modes that are available. So you have to determine the type of pacing mode that is being used for this kind of patient based on his um, based on his um, preoperative uh, myocardial uh, problem, and you have to look at the indication. You have to know much more about the indication. Is this a patient who has a congenital congenital you know, complete heart block? Uh, has he any you know, bundle branch blocks or he has a has he a tachydysrhythmia, sick sinus syndrome, uh, similar, which is the primary indication of pacing for this patient. Is it a tachydysrhythmia, bloody dysrhythmia? And then the next thing you would like to know is when was this device implanted? Because it has a direct implication for various things. If it was recently implanted, then there is a possibility that the leads can get easily dislodged which is one where it's like any other, you know, lesion. You have a skin incision, it has to heal by fibrosis. Likewise, these devices, the leads which are placed in the myocardium, they need to have anchoring, proper anchoring into the atrial or ventricular tissue. And this happens by means of fibrosis at the tip or wherever it has happened. This also has some implications because when it is directly in contact with the right atrium or right ventricle, the amount of current required to trigger off or cause uh, defibrillation or uh, you no know, pace is less. Whereas if there is amount of fibrotic tissue around the tip, then the amount of current required becomes higher. So this is why you have to know the duration or when it was implanted. The other is the extreme, which is what is the battery life of this device? Does it have sufficient battery life for us to for us to you know to continue to do it or does it need to be changed so sometimes you look at a pulse deficit so if you look at the ecg and if you look at the uh, feel the pulse rate then you will see the difference of the heart rate itself so you can always current generators have a very large lithium batteries which are 
very depending on the usage if it's an ai cd the battery life comes down because it is constantly being used for giving shocks or delivering shock whereas if it's only a simple pacing device it can be have a very up to 20 years of life so there are so many implications of knowing when this device is implanted and again when and where was it last checked so has the patient been going for frequent tests or checkups so when was the last time it was checked up so you can know the amount of amperes that is required you can know how many shocks were delivered you can get a holter done to see how effective or how often the device is being used and the next is to check the anatomical position of the generator if you have an adult it is generally kept under the clavicle so if you have a child it is kept on the abdominal cavity so you can know where is the anatomical position of the generator so that you can avoid any electrical activity like cautery diathermy or you know keeping your return electrode far away from the site of the generator obviously like i said you can look at the battery status when there is a last checking up check up or if it has been it has been interrogated we call it interrogation so you use radio frequency to look at the statistics of the device and if there is any reset mode information so this after that then you have to confirm or you find get a confirmation of all the satisfactory thresholds like i said for causing uh, have have uh, you no know, triggering off and things like that once that is done that is good so generally when you do a reset you have to go to a asynchronous mode which is it is only pacing there is no trigger no sensing it just ao or vo depending on atrial or do so the first is chamber paced second and third functions become null so you have asynchronous pacing so what do you do next as soon as you have a patient with a pacemaker in place you do a 12 year ecg so you look at the how it is functioning whether it is functioning as expected so you get a confirmation of the expected function then you look at the polarity of the pacing so then you look at the baseline rate or the programmed rate or is it the patient's intrinsic rhythm or is it a program rate which is or that means that the pacemaker is functioning or being actively used so if you look at this typically these arrows point to small spikes can you i don't know if it's visible these small spikes i am i'm sure this is much more visible so this is preceding the p wave which means that it is sole atrial pacing spikes and this is followed by capture which means if you say capture that means you expect a p wave followed by a qrs complex so this is atrial pacing sole atrial pacing or single atrial pacing there is definite capture and the qrs is within normal limits in the sense the qrs width is normal so this is typically atrial spacing or atrial pacing spike so this is what you would look for in your ecg the next one is sole pacing spikes with the in the ventricle so these large spikes are basically the ventricle and they are very close to the qrs complex so if you any spike electrical spike or other spiking activity close to the qrs means that it is a ventricle and you have large because it's a large mass of muscle you are there the amplitude of the spike is also very large and what is important for you to recognize is that the qrs complex that follows an artificial paced spiking is broad so a qrs complex proximal spike with a broad qrs generally means it is a ventricular paced spike this is telemetry from an icd device so if you have an icd device and you do a telemetry you see a vt you see a run which is almost nearly about 160 170 with you know less than 2 rr intervals between two when uh, it is in the same chamber and then you see a dc shock so a 14 14 joule shock has been applied and then the rhythm has been terminated vt has been terminated and this is what i said about post shock bradi dystrophy so you have a very slow spike and then after that hopefully the anti bradycardia function will kick off so if you are looking at any ecg this is what you should look at 
So this is typically what you would look for in, a, in, the, in the ECG. The next, of course, you will have to ask for a chest X-ray. So what does the chest X-ray tell us? It gives us very important information regarding the nature and function of an electrical device, which we can say the patient comes unconscious. He has no, he is unable to communicate. And then uh, you see an ECG with a spikes or spikes which are indeterminate. You know there is a pacemaker in situ, but you'd like to know much more information. So how else, how can we get information? This is what I told you earlier about the types of leads that are placed for various requirements, single, monopolar, bipolar, CRTD, shock or CRT itself. So when you get an X-ray, you can make a determination of what it is. So this is typically, if you look at the pulse generator is large, there are multiple sets of leads and wires emanating from the pulse generator or the pacing box and all of them are entering through the SVC and one is terminating in the right atrium, one is going into the right ventricle and a third lead is going into the nearly into the left ventricle which you said is the coronary sinus lead stimulating the left ventricle. So what is this? This is basically a biventricular pacing device or something that is used for resynchronization therapy in heart failure patients. So this is typically that multiple leads coming out of a chamber, you should be, you should realize that this is a multi or a programmable uh, paste pulse, pulse generator. So this is something which is currently being used in the term in sense that uh, they don't have any leads and they were just dropped into the ventricle. That is the right ventricular. These are the leadless pacemaker system. So it acts by touching. It's like a battery inside. So there is an anode and a cathode in, in contact with the right ventricle and it will do the function of a pacemaker or a pulse generator. And what is this? This is something, silly. if you look at the heart, it's a dilated heart. This patient might not tolerate any procedure. So what can you do? You can, or a patient has very difficult venous access or a complex anatomy. So what do you do? You keep a pulse generator subcutaneously and then a lead is placed and uh, a lead is placed subcutaneously in the midline over the heart and you can deliver up to 80 joules of biphasic shock. So this is somewhere you can use it. So this is called a subcutaneous ICD. So if you look at again, the pulse generator is larger multiple circuitry, multiple wires. So what is different here? You have the same three lead, right atrium, right ventricle, coronary. You have a fourth one. You have a thick, thick uh, sort of, you know, thick line or band you see, which is a very dark band. And these are the widened shock coils. So they are located on the right ventricular lead. And this is the device or the lead which actually delivers the shock to the patient. So this is the CRT defibrillator or this is something which is used like an AAC. The AACD is called the CRTD now. So there can be some complications also which you can pick up uh, by using a chest X-ray. This is a unipolar. If you see smaller device, not much circuitry, single wire. But what is the problem with the wire? It has perforated the ventricle. So the right ventricle has been perforated and the lead is actually lying outside the heart. Okay, so that is the problem with, so that is something that you can easily pick up. There are multiple examples, but I'm only giving you a few. So you have to, when do you have to interrogate the device? So normally there are some recommendations given by the Heart Rhythm Society. So if it is for an AICD, it's within six months. And for a conventional pace generator, it's 12 months. And for a CRTD, it is three to six months. So how do you know? Pacing is dependent on pacing. So if you do an ECG and you see a pacing burden of more than or over 40% pacing spikes preceding P wave and QRS complex or predominant pacing rhythm in the ECG trace, then you say the patient is pacemaker dependent. So if it is, if the pacemaker spikes are actually giving rise to an electrical impulse which is generating 
mechanical activity of the heart and this is more than 40% of the rate of the heart, then this patient is declared as being pacemaker dependent. So that is something that you have to understand or recognize. Is this patient dependent on that pacemaker? Because if he is, then you have to be very careful in how you manipulate or change the modes in case you require or think so you can plan for the type of pottery where you want regional ga what can you do what you should avoid so all those comes into the picture once you understand that this patient is dependent on that pacemaker so this is pacing burden of more than 40 percent more than or equal to 40 percent so do you have to reprogram this at any time yes Reprogramming itself does not protect against internal damage or reset caused by EMF. So, because the electronic circuitry can still be damaged, even if you have reset, it is only the function of the pacemaker that you have changed from, say, whatever it is, dual chamber, dual saver, dual sensing, trigger, inhibitor, you are making it to a single mode that is asynchronous, AO, VO, DO. So, that itself, reprogramming will not protect the device from damage. But there are some indications for reformat, which is significant pacemaker dependency. So if the patient is significantly dependent, like we defined earlier in the previous slide, more than 40% pacemaker burden or pacing spike, then this means he is very likely to be affected by electromagnetic interference. So you would like to have a single number, that is you have a fixed rate pacing, which is the asynchronous pacing. Or if the patient has a defibrillator function, which can suddenly trigger off unnecessary defibrillation cycles or shocks delivered to the patient. Or if the patient has advanced functions, so you can, like I said, the position three is the rate modulation. So rate modulation, you can disable this rate responsiveness and other energy so that the patient's pacemaker does not unnecessarily cause any disrhythms or change in the rhythm that is not suitable for hemodynamic stability or if you have some special pacing indications. So what does the, what do guidelines tell us? The American Cardiac College of Cardiology and American Heart Association say that all anti-tachycardia therapy is to be disabled before anesthesia. So please remember all anti-tachycardia functions to be disabled before anesthesia is given. So can we make life easier for us just by having a pacemaker. And so what does it, what, what do we say? You increase your heart rate to, you know, 150, 120, run three minutes. So this is something that you can do. You can just increase the pacemaker rate and see what happens. Obviously the pacemaker battery will go down. So there are some alternatives also to, apart from um, radio frequency interrogation for reprogramming. So what can you do? There are some, uh, some, some, um, there are some, uh, the most of the, actually all, all pacemakers have what is called a read switch. The read switch is something very typical to what we have in our vaporizers. That is a bimetallic strip kind of. So one is a read strip and another is a contact strip. So that it increases or decreases the flow. What does it do? If you apply a magnet, they close. And which means that the pacing or defibrillator mode is activated. So the magnet, if you remove, this free switch is open. So this switch magnetically activated enables alteration of the pacing or defibrillator modes. So, and once you disable it, which means with the magnet closing the switch, you get it into an asynchronous mode at a device or a determined, predetermined rate, 80, 90, 70, whatever it is. So generally 70 or 80. So it delivers as an asynchronous mode at a specific rate of 78. And this is what I told you earlier. It is only chamber paste, AOO, VOO or DO, depending on the, whether there are two, 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 uh, two pacing leads or it's, it's, it's an R and R V. But basically all it does is it just paces. That's all. So an asynchronous mode, obviously, is of suboptimal in patients with underlying native rhythm. So what can happen is your blood pressure can drop and things can happen. So there won't be any, say, hypotension. You are not able to have a desired increase in cardiac output. Well, there, is, there are some disadvantages, but at least it will not trigger a malignant disease. So you can use a magnet over the 
pacing device or the pulse generator to close the read switch and bring it to an asynchronous mode. So that obviously it is a magnetic interference. So the magnet has to be kept in a very specific position on top of the pulse generator. There are some specified or predetermined places where the read switch is. So you should know where it is. So removal of the magnet at the end of the surgery will again reactivate the function or the defibrillator. So just taking it away will help us to get it back to its original function without having to externally radio frequency interrogate and change it. So interoperatively, what you have to do, your anesthetic plan should consider the cardiac state, the various comorbidities and the surgical intervention that the patient is undergoing. So like for all other things, because anything can cause change in the the uh, milieu of the myocardium, so avoid hypoxia, hypercapnia, acidosis, electrolyte abnormalities, especially potassium and hypokalemia. So any of these can precipitate dysrhythmias or interfere with the pacemaker capture. So you should keep take cognizance of all this. So you have to identify the device and the response to electric artery. Have a backup mode. Have a backup mode is generally what do you have a backup mode? You can have transcutaneous pacing available or you can have a transvenous uh, site or a port available to in case there is a problem. And of course, once that is in various modes, asynchronous or pacing mode or patient is in programmable mode, always, always confirm hemodynamic stability. So patients with implanted defibrillators, electro external defibrillation, you can, like I said, transcutaneous electrodes can be placed in an anterior posterior con. Normally we keep it in the apex to the base. Whereas here you have to keep an AP configuration and it should at least be 10 to 15 centimeters away from the edge of the device. And once there is a dysrhythmia, you should always follow the ACLS protocols. So there is no, there is nothing else you can do. You have to go for your CPR with ALS or ACLS protocols. So the thing is, and transcutaneous electrodes in an anterior posterior configuration and the device should be, the electrode should be at least 10 to 15 centimeters away from the edge of the device. So what do you monitor intraoperatively? So we have to do the minimum mandated, that is ISA uh, mandated uh, minimum monitoring, ECG displayed constantly which demonstrates the pacing spike. So please make sure that the voltages or the height of the QRS complex on your monitor is 2x or 3x or 4x so that you can pick up the pacing spike. And you have to monitor for effects of dysrhythmia uh, for of diathermy. So sometimes because there is a spike because of the EMI, it can be double sensing or the heart rate may because of sensitivity. So if you go into the monitor, there is a diagnostic mode, there's a pacing mode. So please putting on put the ECG on a pacing mode. So once it is a pacing mode, it will neglect everything else so that there is no double sensing. So the heart rate one is the spicing peak, uh, the, the pacing spike or the QRS, both can be read as heart rate and you can have double sensing, doubling up the heart rate. So a monitoring should always include the pulse plethysmograph measurement and display. So that if there is electrical interference, you will always look at the you can always look at the pulse plethysmograph to see if there is any similar change in the pulse plethysmograph. If there is no difference, then it is. If there is no difference, then you know that it is an artifact on the ECG. Same thing with the, the invasive blood pressure monitoring, beat to beat mechanical capture, that you know there is an electrical impulse followed by a mechanical comp the, uh, the sequence of contraction of the heart, and you have cardiac output generated. This is true, especially for those who have cardiac resynchronization therapy devices, which is used in the patient with heart failure. So but if you have to place a central venous axis, uh, you should understand that, uh, like I said, they don't get implanted or fibros for a little bit of time. So up to three weeks, three months, uh, there might be a chance of displacement of bleed. So after three months, it is safe enough. And uh, whenever you are putting a central venous axis, the mode should always be made into asynchronous. So one is use a um, monitoring, in the monitoring mode, you have to put it on pacing mode. Then make sure that there is no double sensing. Third is have a pulse plethysmograph to tell you whether there is any actual difference between the ECG and the pulse rate. And in patients with heart failure, 
I invasive blood pressure. So you know that there is a cardiac output generated with every spike. And if you have to use pacing wires or the central venous axis, then best is to put it in a femoral site or you know um, any other location where it might not cause displacement of leaves. But if it is more than three months old, it is safe to use the central roots, IJV, EJV, subclavian, or whatever it is. But make sure that the device is in an asynchronous mode. So, so this is basically um, you see here that the patient has his own has his own um, uh, has his own uh, T wave, and there is no pacing spike. Whereas at some point there is a probably no T wave or uh, P wave, so there is an atrial spike. So this is atrial atrial pacing, atrial sensing, and it is inhibiting. So a normal P wave is inhibiting a spike of pacing. So this is the AAI pacing, atrial the chamber pace, chamber sensed, and in an inhibited mode. So this is dual chamber pacing. So you have both a atrial spike and a ventricular spike. So these are all pacing. They're all pacing the patient and because there is also a ventricular or a, this is basically to synchronize the AV. So this is mostly used in postcardiac surgical patients. So a dual chamber is used so that you have the, uh, the advantage of uh, synchronicity between atrial contraction and ventricular contraction. So atria contracts, fills the ventricle and ventricle is triggered off to cause contraction or mechanical contraction. This is the dual chamber base. So what about anesthesia itself? Anesthetic molecules per se cause no interference. So in patients where the indication is a prolonged QT interval syndrome, you should avoid drugs which are serotonergic like condensetron, methadone, or haloperidol, and very high levels of inhaled agents like more than avoid more than 1.5 to 2 mic. So you all and we also understand that molecules like you know fentanyl and dexmedetomidin per se in larger doses can cause bradycardia and then they should be used judiciously. Mm, succinylcholine or succimethonium basically because of fasciculations can cause oversensing and cause inhibition of pacing. So this is something amongst the anesthetic molecules, ondansetron, methadone, haloperidol or high levels of inhaled agents. Those which can cause bradycardia called like fentanyl and dexmedetomidin and that which can cause mechanical malfunction or fasciculations like succinylcholine, succinylcholine should be used cautiously. Generally, both general anesthesia and regional anesthesia are pretty safe in the presence of patient. If you know all the basics and you understand why it is being used. What happens when the patient becomes hypovolemic? In patients with fixed or asynchronous modes, like I said earlier, there is no reflex tachycardia due to hypovolemia. So, in these patients, you may not, you given a spinal or a subarachnoid block, which has gone high, there is hypotension, but there is no tachycardia because this is on an asynchronous or a fixed rate. So here, if you have invasive arterial blood pressure monitoring or cardiac output monitoring, and when you know there is something which can cause hypotension, like volume redistribution with a subarachnoid block, prompt volume regulation should be given as appropriate. So it's very important to understand the limitations that you have in terms of having a device in place. So cautery use, like I said, use very short bursts or tell the surgeon one second with 10 second intervals, short bursts. The return current plate should be kept as far away as possible from the direction of current or through the pulse generator. Lowest amplitude, like I said earlier, bipolar is best it is recommended. And at the same time, keep a hand on the pulse. Don't forget, I see you know, when we were training, it was always, always, always hand on the pulse. Now I see you are a mile away from the patient watching WhatsApp or you know doing something else in the OT. So careful monitoring of pulse, pulse oximetry, that is the plethysmographic wave or the arterial pressure waveform itself. So always keep a defibrillator with pacemaker function like a transcutaneous pacemaking uh, you know, mode with paddles on and a temporary pulse generator for emergency use in the premises. So it should be available if you are handling such patients. 
So cardioversion and defibrillation, uh, there are some precautions in the sense that there are some, some built-in safety features in the, uh, in the device, which is called a Zener diode. So what does the Zener diode do? It generally redirects the DC voltage surge energy to the electrodes, ensuring delivery to the myocardium. So with AICDs, there is something called capacitive coupling. And uh, this may happen and result in the energy being discharged directly at the electrode myocardial interface. And uh, that's how it could cause transient failure to capture or sometimes permanent failure. So this uh, Zener diode is normally used to direct the voltage surge to the electrodes, but it can also have some other implications. So whenever you're using CIDs in locations other than an OT or for other procedures, you need to be careful. So MRI, when you're using MRI, again here the frequency is less than 10 to the power of length. So 30 to 3000 hertz. So what can happen? The read switch within the device closes and asynchronous review of pacing can occur. So inhibition of pacing can happen or rapid pacing can happen. So there can be again discomfort at the site, patient can die or the tip of the electrode get heated up. So uh, obviously there are, uh, there's always innovation, there is always technological advances. So there are what are called MR safe devices, which are recently available and can be used in a facility of magnetic resonance imaging. So older, older devices are labeled as MR non-conditional, which means that they are unsafe in MR field. So please uh, ascertain before you start or take a patient with a pacemaker inside the MR chamber gantry, whether it is MR safe or MR non-conditional. Others, of course, is radio frequency ablation. So quite a lot of patients come for other lesions, you know, like uh, warts or for, for neuralgias, trigeminal neuralgia, ablation also. Keep the current path as far away from the pulse generator and the lead. The other, of course, is uh, the use of lithotripsy. So lithotripsy is again a form of radio energy. So avoid focus of the beam near the pulse generator and uh, disable atrial pacing if system triggers on the R wave. So the, if you see the pacing, it can happen. With the, so you have to disable the atrial pacing. So the lithotripter itself should be kept at least six inches away from the uh, device. So better is to time it to the ECG. So the pulse is timed to the ECG. And of course, like I said, and if disable all the anti tachydystrichia functions or anti tachycardia functions are considered and deactivate the rate modulation function on the device. <clears throat> what is not contraindicated in the presence of MR? Radiation therapy. Radiation therapy is basically, you know, higher of higher energy and this is considered safe, especially when you use a non-neutron beam. A non-neutron beam can minimize the risk of device reset if dependent, the pacemaker is dependent. If a neutron beam is used, then you have to evaluate the phone because all these patients who undergo radiation, they have cycles. So it could be, you know, two or three cycles a week for 12 cycles at a time or 12 weeks at a time. So if a neutron beam is used, the pacemaker function should be evaluated every week. And if it is, say, if the patient is having CA breast or a CA lung with a, with a, with a upper lobe uh, nodule, so the CID pocket must be relocated if it interferes with the treatment. So if the beam has to be directed at very close to where the device is, then you have to relocate the CID itself in another pocket. Electroconvulsive therapy, there are no EMI effects or permanent malfunction with electroconvulsive therapy. What may cause problem is post ECT seizure. So seizure activity afterwards may cause prolonged over sensing. So in, for some patients who have, say, bipolar disorders who require frequent uh, ECTs, it may be better to reprogram to an asynchronous mode in appropriate patients. Also, the defibrillator function should be disabled to prevent inappropriate shocks. What about transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation? 
impulses by our skill. Several skin electrodes at small hertz are given in rectangular pulses every 20 milliseconds. So technically, theoretically, it may cause pacemaker inhibition. So asymptomatic inhibition can be seen on ambulatory monitoring. If you have a holter on this patient and is receiving tens, the patient might have temporary inhibition, which is the patient might not even know or doesn't have any symptoms. So, so unipolar uh, program devices are to be used, and this is tens can be safely used with bipolar pacemakers and defibrillators. So, this is something that you have to keep if you are, especially somebody practicing pain medicine like Dr. Malhotra. So, any of these say patients who are coming for radio, radio frequency ablation or uh, tens or such things should be monitored carefully. Finally, once you have taken good care of this patient, you have had a successful anesthetic uh, you know, experience of taking the patient through the whole thing extubated, what do you do post-operatively? High density, high dependency unit and continuous unit. Once that is done, if the patient has, the device has been programmed to an asynchronous mode, you subject them to a full telemetric check and reprogram it back to their original requirements or needs. And all we have, we said the recommendation is all anti tachycardia therapy, um, the functions should be um, disabled. So, you have to re-enable them or reprogram them back to their original settings. So this is very important for us in terms of bringing the patient back to his normal state. So perioperative management of patients with CID, what are the recommendations? A class one recommendation is patients with ICDs who have preoperative reprogramming to inactivate tachytherapy should be on cardiac monitoring continuously during the entire period of inactivation. It could be a day, it could be one, two days, three days and external defibrillation equipment should be readily available. So the second is system should be in place to ensure that these devices are reprogrammed to active therapy before discontinuation of cardiac monitoring and discharge from the facility. This is level of evidence being seen. So finally, we all understand that technology or devices generally outlast patients. So there is some issue why I kept this slide or cartoon is pacemaker is lasting longer than they did. There is an implication for this, especially in critical care settings. So what do you do with the device after the patient has ceased to exist? That is, the patient has succumbed to his primary or other problem. So you have to explant these, explant these devices prior to um, whatever form of uh, you know, last rites that are performed, whether it is burial or cremation, especially cremation, because there is a risk of lithium batteries exploding. So you have to dispose them off safely. So technically what is done is all these devices are interrogated after death. Basically to, it is like an autopsy. You want to know why it happened or what caused the death. Was it pacemaker malfunction or something? So ideally, ideally, all of them should be interrogated after. But this is just not feasible. It can happen in the middle of the night. The patient's body needs to be taken away. You won't have anybody around. But if it is possible, you can interrogate it after death. Or if you explant it, you can still send it to the manufacturer for looking at the various parameters of the device. So all ICD should be interrogated after death find out the cause of death and send to the manufacturer. So there is another further issue about third world countries, poor countries, whatever you want to name this. Can I reuse this? Uh, yes, there have been some instances where the devices have been reused because it is an expensive thing. More lives could be saved when supported to patients, families, medical community, manufacturers and government. Currently, there are some issues about uh, infection being caused in these things. But there have been uh, this uh, basically uh, in circulation a few years ago, 10 years, 12 years ago, but somebody from India, they have used uh, explanted re-sterilized defibrillators safely. And it can be done, but uh, yes, industry driven. So there is always a problem about this. Like I said, again, 
families or patients themselves may have reservations of using a device which has been removed from somebody who died. So you don't mind uh, getting, uh, you know, a cornea or a liver or a lung or, uh, you know, something similar. But when it comes to devices, there seems to be some reluctance on the part of uh, patients and families to use, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, you're taking a second-hand car. You don't want it. You don't believe that organs are second-hand, but a device suddenly becomes second-hand. So, which is a pity. Which is a pity. So, anyway, that's uh, that's about the last slide. Uh, to conclude, there are lots of patients or more number of patients with these devices which will present to us in various situations for anesthesia. Fortunately, most of them would be well optimized and well rehabilitated, which is good for us. In case that is not so, then you have to take care, adequate uh, you know, assessment. So most important is understanding the function of the CIDs, the problems associated with the comorbidities or the underlying problem, how you assess, how you draw up a perioperative plan of management will help to prevent any mishaps associated with patient care. So... Thank you very much for listening patiently. And I have a small exercise that Dr. Naveen wanted me to do in between, but I was a bit reluctant to do it in between because I have added these few, few sort of, I don't know if it is stimulating for your brain. It might be easy for a lot of students, but let us start with some physiology. A couple of, not a couple, maybe five or six of multiple choice questions. I don't know how you will answer. Maybe we'll see it on the chat box so Dr. Malhotra can tell me. Yes, sir. Uh, what we'll do is, uh, Dr. Angur Khandelwal is also there. He will yes. coordinate. Uh, you yes. give one question and give them one minute to answer. Yes. And then uh, Angur will say, sir, please go on to the next question. So in this way, we'll go with it, sir. Yes, so sir. Good evening, sir. For the participants uh, to please type in the chat box uh, uh, the uh, responses. Okay. So this is how it is. All arrhythmias end. So that is something that is very unfortunate, but that's a fact of life. So let me let me just ask you. This is the simplest to the facts. Small physiology question. So, sir, I'll, no sir, I'll yes. ask the question, sir. Yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, the first question is: SA note acts as a pacemaker of the heart because of the fact that it number one is capable of generating impulses spontaneously. Number two has rich sympathetic innervations. Number three has poor cholinergic innervations. And number four generates impulses at the highest rate. Please type your answers in the chat box. So the most of them are answering answering B as the uh, answer. One minute. We'll give them one minute. Go yeah. On. Yes, sir. Okay. Right. Yes, sir. Most of them have answered uh, D as the option. Some of them have answered A, and few of them have mentioned both A and D as the answers. Right. Okay. Though A is also an answer, but D is the appropriate answer because when you have a pacemaker, the only pacemaking site that predominates is the one which the which generates the highest rate. So D is the correct answer. So physiologically, we have to talk about physiology. Yes, it is capable of generating impulses spontaneously, but there are other areas also. The AV node can do, the ventricle itself can do, but this is the one which generates the highest rate. So it takes over as the pacemaker. That is why it's called a pacemaker, which is the highest number of impulses. So D is the correct answer. Very good. Thank you, sir. Next. Second question which is termed as a pharmacological pacemaker. The options are number A, epinephrine, B, norepinephrine, C, dopamine, and D, isoprenaline. Please type your answers in the chat box.
Okay, and good. Yes, sir. The uh, one minute is over, sir. Most of them have answered uh, A, and some of them as D, epinephrine or isoprenelines. Sir, if you can reveal the correct answer, sir. Yes, please. The answer is isoprenelin. Epinephrine is both alpha beta. Norepinephrine is predominantly alpha. Dopamine is dopa, alpha, beta at various concentrations. Whereas isoprenelin is a pure beta stimulant. So, which is why isoprenelin is called as the pharmacological pacemaker. Thank you, sir, for the answer. Next query, next question. So, that was basically about there are fundamentals, physiology, pharmacology. Now we'll yes, just yes. briefly go into whatever is that we have talked about in this recent Yes, sir. I'll read the question. A 70 years male with a pacemaker is scheduled for a cervical laminectomy for spinal canal stenosis. Which of the following statements is incorrect? A. The rate modulation function, if present, should be turned off. B. The pacemaker should be reprogrammed to asynchronous mode. C. Monopolar diathermy, if needed, should be used in short burst of 1 to 2 seconds. D. Median nerve SSCP monitoring is not recommended as it may interfere with the functioning of the pacemaker. Please type your answers. So, sir, most of them have answered D, either D or C, if we can. Yes. Yeah. So, we, will, we have talked about rate modulation because over sensing or under sensing can cause disruption of function. And this is a recommendation we said by ACCHA. It should be turned off. This is the, This is not the incorrect answer. Pacemaker should be reprogrammed to asynchronous mode. That is what we said, AOO, VOO. This is also not incorrect statement. Monopolar diathermy, we recently said, because it is the anode and cathode are far away. There is a large antenna loop. It should be used in very short bursts of one to two seconds. This is also not incorrect. So the last one is the one which is the incorrect statement. That is Media now SSCP, they are used very small currents and short periods. So, and again, the median nerve is far away from the site. So, it can be, it does not interfere with the function of the pacemaker. So, typically, yes, median nerve SSCPs can be used. So, this is the correct answer. D is the correct answer. So, good job, those who have answered D, and well done, those who have attempted the questions. So, can we move on to the next question? Yes, please. So next question is position V of five, NSP. Five. Position, position five. five. Uh, yeah. Position five of NSP or BPEC code denotes A programmability, B chamber sensed, C response to sensing, and D multi-site pacing. Please type your answers. So, sir, there has been uh, mixed responses A, B, and D. Majority have answered D. Most of them answered D. Yeah. A, B, and D. But majority. D, D maximum. Q is A, some are B, but majority are D. Yeah. Yes, sir. That means they were attentive. They were attentive during the, they saw the slides properly. So, D is the correct answer. This is not my uh, coding. So, 
I can't uh, give an explanation because this is the standard explanation as per the regulatory authorities. Yes. So this is the last one, I think. The last question is intraoperative monitoring in patients with CIID may not include A, ECG, B, plethysmograph, C, cardiac output, D, invasive arterial pulse pressure. So please type your answers. So this time it's a unanimous answer. Everyone answering the same option. They have been attentive, they'll answer, all will answer correctly. So they have all have answered C. C. Wonderful, yes, wonderful, wonderful. wonderful. I'm glad, I'm glad uh, after a full day's work, late in the evening for an hour plus, they have listened uh, and concentrated. That's what is important. And I'm... Uh, because these are all, the last three were uh, basically from the lecture itself. So that I wanted to know, because these are all important, what not to be done, what should be done. This is this slide is what should be done. You should have an ECG, you should have a pulse breath over there. And where a patient is heart failure, or you want to see whether there is electrical and mechanical coupling, invasive arterial pressure monitoring. So all these are important for us. So I think uh, this is, oh, I'm sorry. This is, a, there's one more slide. There's one more. The last question is recommendations for CRT or CRTD interrogation after placement. A, within six months, B, within 12 months, C, within three to six months, and D, within 24 months. Type yeah. Keep typing your answers, at least attempt it. This is again from the slide material only. Yeah, the last one. Unanimous, sir. Again. Okay. Yes, sir. It's almost the same option for everyone. Option C. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I'm so happy. This is why I wanted it to be after the all the MCQs after the talk because we all know how much they have retained and how much they have actually concentrated on during the whole process of the talk because generally between the lecture is they get distracted. So this is uh, so I I hope everybody had. Uh, has some take home messages up to the end of it. And uh, I'm thankful to Dr. Naveen and Dr. Ankur for being there during the whole process. Thank you, Naveen. And uh, sir, is there sir, anything sir. else, questions? Yes, sir. Uh, first, I, I, of all, first of all, we must congratulate all the participants who have participated actively. Big round of applause for them. <laughs> they have really yes, please. yes, please. Huge round. Yes. Huge round. And now I will be, uh, Ankur, there are two, three questions in the chat box. Yes, At sir. Time, I am allowing everybody to unmute themselves so that they can interact with sir directly. Yes. Once all will be muted, then you can unmute yourself. Ankur, unmute yourself and go. Those who have any queries, please uh, raise your hand and uh, we will let your queries be straightforward to sir. Uh, one we have in the chat box, sir. Uh, what is the method to deactivate pacemaker and ICD? Is it the same? Sir, please unmute yourself, sir. Okay. Um, so the all of them are basically they have a red device, like I mentioned. So all of them can be deactivated with a magnet. The only thing is you should know where the red switch is present on the particular magnet. So you should, I would suggest that if you are so keen, you should go back to the manufacturer's site and see where the magnet should be placed for deactivating the device. So a magnet is the safest to do it. So if somebody has uh, any magnet will do, it doesn't need to be a very powerful magnet because the reed switches are very, very light uh, sort of filaments. So if you have a magnet of any source, the only thing is it should be kept placed 
at that point on the on the device till you finish the uh, surgical exercise after which if you replace it or remove it it goes back to its original program thank you sir for the answer hope it's uh, clear to the one who has asked it uh, anybody do, does anybody has any other query one question from dr vivek anand uh, it is to you sir please explain about multi site will the record kept in one uh, there is some disturbance please i'll repeat it sir please explain about multi site pacing will the electrode be kept in one chamber and it paces from multi sites or is it different different sir it's all in different sites so multi site pacing is typically like what we said is the aicd so this is in ra this is in rv this is in lv so that constitutes the position 5 or multi site pacing so it acts both as a pacer as well as a defibrillator which if it has a shock coil also on the right atrial lead uh, right ventricular lead so any any say bipolar can be on the same the same electrode can have on the ra with one at the tip and one close to the tip that becomes bipolar so unipolar can be single lead or you can have two leads or you can have a single lead with both the electrodes on the same lead or you have multiple leads or multiple leads in various chambers so that is multi site pacing so you can pace either the atrium the ventricle or dual thank you sir for the answer sir i do have one query we we really we do encounter patients with pacemaker in situ coming for an mri yes. and uh, we know that mri suit is again a challenging situation for conduction of uh, sedation or anesthesia if required what additional challenges do we encounter in such a suit with the pacemaker in situ and how do we proceed the pacemaker an mri one is you have to ascertain whether it is mr compatible mr safe or mr non conditional so once you have ascertained if it is mr non conditional then this patient cannot be taken into the mri suite so he has to have alternate modes of imaging but if it's mr compatible or mr conditional then you have to make sure that you can use any procedure or sedative except for those which i said can cause severe bradycardia like say fentanyl or dexmedetomidine so if you are using it for a pediatric patient i would suggest don't use a large amount of inhaled agents so if you are concerned about nausea vomiting you have to avoid especially if it is a patient who has a prolonged qt for which he has relieved received the uh, pacemaker or device so safer to not to give them any uh, um, you know anti emetics like uh, serotonergic drugs otherwise you can use any otherwise is anybody speaking otherwise you can use uh, any technique so even if it's feasible i would we we have often used regional anesthesia in patients who are undergoing mr say like giving them a spinal outside stabilizing them taking them inside once they are you know so people who cannot st stand straight or have severe pain for lying down so we can modify so we can use if somebody has a painful you give them a block and take them inside they are comfortable you just give them some midazolam they'll sleep off so there are so many but fun fundamental to this is whether the device itself is mr safe conditional or non conditional non conditional it rules out you just have to take you cannot do anything else but if you have to give them a gaf especially a pediatric patients or a neurosurgical patients or intubated just go ahead and uh, you know um, do it with alternative medications or things like that with low doses of uh, inhaled agents less than 1.5 mg and avoid large doses of uh, other molecules which can cause so succinamethanum basically try to avoid because once he is in the gantry to get him out and do something is difficult i would suggest you know again you have uh, the transcutaneous pads which are mr compatible so you can use them safely put them in an asynchronous mode and do it off get them into an asynchronous mode okay sir thank you so much for the answer sir any more queries we'll take up ina uh, has asked what to what has to be done if pacemaker stops in between the surgery Make a stop. That's what you should have alternate, uh, you know, uh, so devices like transcutaneous pacing, which can be take, which can take over. And uh, quite often, if it's a general surgical, I mean, if it's a cardiac surgical uh, location, you can quickly pace a central axis and put a temporary transcutaneous pacing. So, if the pacemaker stops functioning, then there has to be a good reason why it has stopped functioning. Usually, either battery failure or 
there is some electrical severe magnetic electromagnetic interference which has caused it to heat and heat up the electronic circuitry and fail pacing so normally if you have done a routine good pre operative assessment programming done it should not happen so this is a failure of good assessment in the pre operative peak when you have taken up a patient but if it does have i would always uh, anybody with a pacemaker in situ please keep transcutaneous paddles in the ap ap position and uh, it should the defibrillator should support a transcutaneous pacing cable sir in that case can isoprenaline be a good rescue yes, agent yes it can be it can be it should be available also like thank you for pointing out whenever there is a pacemaker in pc2 always keep even if it has to be discarded at the end of surgery please load up some isoprenaline and keep it if it's available because yes you there it's not that there are not enough beta receptors in the in the uh, you know pacing uh, circuitry you can use it as a good resort which is why it's called a pharmacological pacer and you can use it in higher concentrations yes it will cause some amount of vasodilatation but it will kick start the heart if it's not there the extreme is to use epinephrine thank you sir for the answer sir my last one more query who are the stakeholders who should be present in the theater uh, with the pacemaker in c2 conducting uh, being conducted as surgery should a cardiologist be present no. mandatorily no 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 okay should anybody from the company be present no not required not required not okay. required see basically all this is supposed to be done uh, preoperatively the reprogramming part in case there is nobody available like you said you like one of the questions was use a magnet so you can safely use a magnet as long as you know the basal heart rate that the asynchronous mode on with the basal rate that the program is the, the device is capable of so there are some things that we are good perioperative physicians i don't think we need a cardiologist as uh, you know crutches for us so we should not be we should not require them at any point of time but yes post operatively also they are available once the telemetry device is used for interrogating the device the usually it is done by uh, either the cardiologist or by the manufacturing uh, representative and they reprogram it back to uh, the normal settings so except to evaluate it as part of his duty for having uh, you know an electrophysiologist will look at the settings again and see if the capture and you know uh, the amount of uh, how many ohms of impedance it is uh, giving so otherwise it is uh, it is nobody is required nobody is required. thank you sir for the answer sir There is one more sir uh, question coming up uh, is bundle of his pacing is how many leads and where it it should be placed oh bundle of his pacing it's very complicated only electrophysiologists do we rarely 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 bundle of his pacing is very abnormal in the sense you rarely get a patient with a bundle of his pacing it is a domain of the electrophysiologist himself and it is normally not used as a mode of clinical management bundle of his electrode stimulation is used for mapping aberrant pathways and it is done under uh, guidance in 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 the uh, in the cath lab and uh, i i have not at least in my career seen somebody with a uh, bundle of his uh, i i don't i'm not aware i'm yes. not aware dr. let me be very frank sir dr. dr tashin ask about where to place cautery pad for head and neck surgery in patients with pacemaker a uh, head and neck surgery cautery pad uh, foot is the safest part foot gluteal region anywhere so like i said it 15 cm 20 cm away from the pg so the the electrodes can be used away and you know anywhere else so as long as the pathway if it is by that's a, that's the best thing bipolar current bipolar current is the safest and if head and neck surgery insist on bipolar because it is not very far away from the pulse generator so these are all the things that you can once you are aware of if you do a few cases you will be very sure about what to tell your surgical colleagues thank you sir for the answer sir so sir can uh, sir my last query since i am working in neurosurgical theater can a patient with pacemaker who uh, is suffering from parkinson's disease now require a dbs placement can two devices be placed at the same time i have not encountered it is just hypothetical a patient yes, with a pacemaker yes. now requires a placement of a yes. dbs yes. can yes. it be done sir yes. it can be done it can be done okay. it, it, except that the pocket is far away and the leads are far away so they don't generally cause any interference so a dbs 
it is essentially a pacemaker. Uh, you know that is that is a pulse generator, except exactly. that it is stimulating the uh, you know dopaminergic areas for this patient, whereas this is in the heart. So there is uh, yes, it can be used. It's something like you know a spinal cord stimulator for say um, chronic pain uh, patients that Dr. Naveen does. Yes, it can be safely used, but if you you have to interact with like you said stakeholders. So all stakeholders should come inside and, and decide about what is the best for them. Yes, it can be safe. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, did, uh, there is my... Complimentary messages only, sir. And uh, one more question has come from Dr. Rajesh. He's asking for anesthesia for pacemaker insertion. What regional nerve blocks can be used? Uh, regional but depends on where you are placing it. See, generally pediatric patients, you need to give them general anesthesia because it is a little painful. Whereas if you are doing a adult, mostly it is done under local infiltrative anesthesia. They make a pocket under the clavicle. But yes, you can give, you can give a PEC one, PEC two, a serratus anterior block. Any of these can be given. But please remember, one small twig, uh, you know, comes over the clavicle. So the innovation from over the clavicle, you may need to use, uh, you know, selective uh, blocks, uh, um, either uh, as a supraclavicular itself, you can give a block so that uh, you can, but uh, if it's an adult patient, a little bit of sedation and lots of local infiltration is good enough. But if you have to, if you want to make your life more complicated, give them PEC1, PEC2 serratus blocks, because if you are depositing things there, then, uh, you know, there's again a source of infection multiple pokes, multiple deposits of, uh, you know, when you're using an ultrasound probe and things like that, if close to a pacemaker pocket is not advisable. So generally very sterile conditions, lots of local infiltration and, uh, you know, they can make a pocket there with a little sedation, fentanyl, mida, some group of all if you require. Like I pointed out, sir, nine out of 10 times it is done under local anesthesia very comfortably. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, uh, there, are no more uh, uh, there are no more questions, sir, and uh, uh, everybody is now on a congratulatory mode. And I also take this opportunity to thank you for uh, sparing your valuable time and taking a very important and practical class. You made this difficult topic look very, very simple, sir. I can tell you. And uh, uh, for the listeners, this class will be available on ISA YouTube channel. ISA NHQ, and uh, it's it was a pleasure listening to you, sir. Uh, really thankful to you. And uh, next time, next Monday, we shall meet again for a class on anesthesia for patients with a chronic renal failure by Dr. Aruna Parameshwari from Chennai. See you next week, next Monday. Thank you, respected Dr. Gopinath, sir. For thank you, thank you so much, Naveen. Thank you so much. Very, sir, very nice Monday to see Monday. you. Thank you, Uncle Gopinath. At Gopinath, how are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. How are you? Nice seeing I'm, you. I'm Dr. Ramchandra from Karnul. Yes. I'm in New York now. Oh, you are in New York, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very, very excellent lecture, actually. Actually, elaborate on this very tough subject, and you made it very simple for post graduates. Very nice. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. So nice. April yeah, I have seen the uh, implantation of uh, these uh, pacemakers and uh, at, AICD in uh, New York in Coney Island Hospital, but they gave general anesthesia and did it. They did not do under local. I see, I see. That's also a thing, but it depends on patient preferences. If they refuse to get it done, then you have no choice. No, here, here the people, they don't want to take the risk and they just give general uh, general and do it. <laughs> I see, I see. You know, but at the, at the end of the day, I, I think uh, if an anesthetist is safe, no technique is unsafe. <laughs> Uh, what do you? I, uh, that that's my that's my take on any anesthesia we uh, give for uh, you know somebody brain dead. So why not for somebody who's alive? I don't mind. So like yeah. I said, if we if we are safe, everything every technique we practice is safe. I have only one thing I tell all my PGs: please understand your limitations. If you know, yeah. you can count on your fingers what you should not do. If you can avoid that, everything else is doable with in safe hands or in with enough let's say, precautions. So you can count all the things you should not do on your, it's all in your, just 10, 10, less than 10 of them. So 
I, I would, I would, uh, I, I, that's my mantra kind of. Yes, if you are good, everything else is safe. I think uh, with that, we will uh, probably close, uh, Dr. Naveen. Yeah, excellent lecture, actually. Very, I'm very happy today. I mean, it's elaborate, so it uh, clarified so many doubts. When you go to an MRI suit with a pacemaker, what happens? I was not knowing that whether it's MRI compatible or not. And if they are denied uh, MRI, they may have to undergo only CT scan. Sir, you are joining from US? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so, sir, I, I always attend your, uh, this one, Dr. Naveen. It's very excellent. Very nice program. Though it's for, for postgraduates, uh, actually, I stopped working way back in 2015 at SVS Medical College as Professor of Anesthesia. Afterwards, I am not working, but I always attend the webinars. Thank you, sir. And yes, that's the beauty of ISA online. And uh, at, moreover, the, at Jaipur, when you have conducted that uh, ISA national program also, I, I was there attending. Right, sir. Thank you for sharing those memories. Yes, I must say that this is attended, may, meant for postgraduates, but they are attended by consultants, uh, practitioners, and seniors alike. And uh, we have got... Uh -huh. Agniyotri sir also with us, uh, joining us. Uh, he also regularly uh, attends the classes. Yeah, you are doing an excellent job because of COVID only. It's a blessing in disguise. With COVID, uh, this webinar, the number of webinars increased. And the whole credit goes to the teachers who take their uh, precious time and share their experiences and knowledge with the students. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gopinath, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. Thank pleasant you. seeing you always. That pleasant smile and face. Lovely. Yeah, you yeah, make yeah. my day. You make my day, Naveen. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Ankur. Thank you so much, sir, for the wonderful and informative presentation. Thank you so much, sir. Take care, please. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a safe time. Good night. Good night.